So, yeah, it was really cool, all these three presentations. I really loved it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good start of the day, then, uh, yeah. you're here. But you were not shocked in a w well, not shocked. Yeah, no, yeah, the end was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions for Christina? What, what, what's next? Or no, uh, well, we will work on upscaling. That's the, the mission, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And actually, to become mainstream, doesn't really yeah. sound sexy, but that is actually yeah. what needs to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very sexy. <laughs> I think yes, maybe Johanna. I can just uh, hop on that because the question of scale is also something which uh, I've been sort of confronting with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really, uh, you know, it's a good one because sort of, you know, we have to think about what we mean by scale. So it doesn't yeah. mean that we actually sort of have to have, you know, a hundred students running through that project, led to, for example, my project. And, and how far can I, um, am I able to educate uh, sort of, engineers for the future in you know in this you know this particular model or does do we mean by scale that we have more and more and more you know learning lines which actually integrate this ideas of i don't know challenge based more reflexive more responsible innovation so um so i think it's a, it's a good question to to also question scale and not to say you know just no uh, 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 into numbers um because Scale doesn't necessarily solve this issue of really um, delivering quality, because in the end it's about what type of future engineers we are we're going to uh, help uh, go into the world. Yeah. So I think that's uh, just sort of a, a, a point on scale. Yeah. Do you agree with that, uh, Christina? Yeah, scale is, I mean, for me the ideal is to have uh, the, the right kind of learning integrated in all educational programs. Yeah and not just engineering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. uh, I also see that, you, you could see there is a tension where some university managers in a country far from here, um, <laughs> they want to have a, a, something that they can point at as a, as a you know, window dressing mm -hmm. activity. They want to check the box yes. and they yeah. want to be able to take visitors through a, an area with lots of bean bags. And, and, yeah. And so, so for them, it's sufficient to have one yeah. little thing. Uh, it's not that expensive. But how many of them mm. are really prepared to work on the tedious work to transform all the educational programs? Yeah. Yeah. It feels a bit like a warning also, you say. In this, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with running a window, uh, window dressing activity yeah. because it could be the starting seed yeah. the seed crystal yeah. for something else. And the more people who are doing it, the more people are, and I mean, growing into full professors and having our own careers, we will be powerful in the end. But yeah. <laughs> if this is the seed, how do you see what's actually perfect for the, and you have a lot of experience worldwide, uh, working with a lot of universities, you've seen a lot. Is this, if this is, could be a seed, for instance, like innovation space, what is the, innovative climate that's really necessary for the engineers of the future. First of all, do you all agree on what the engineer of the future is? Because I always say it sounds really sexy, but I have absolutely no clue. <laughs> Does anybody have a clue what the engineer of the future is? Because it's in the future, right? I mean... What did that policy do? You have to I mean, <laughs> educate somebody that actually will, will be an engineer in the future and then be... I think the, uh, the official definition, or the, I think how to Eindhoven um, um, understands engineers for the future, is what I said before. So this idea of having, having engineers and being really good in their own discipline, yeah. but also team being team able team to, team. and that is sort of the T-shaped idea. Yeah. Um, but you all agree on that. I also wanted to know before we discuss what's a good climate, do you, do, are we all talking about the same kind of, okay, yeah. That's the easy part. That's the easy part. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> What's the difficult part then? No, for me, it's about transforming the organization. Um, for me, it's all about faculty development and faculty uh, recruitment. Who, mm. who, who gets a good career in academia? Who, who ages gracefully in academia? How can, we, how can we make sure that the people who are doing the right thing have a good career? And... Um, is that also because it, th this university is also busy with valuing scientists? It also has to do with that. That's also going to twist the view on how you actually value people that are doing innovative stuff. Well, I mean, how many people in here know their own H index? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
How, or uh, how many people know their age index, the H index? Not that many research. Ja, yeah? Alfons. Ja, yeah, we have a Tom. few on, <laughs> on the back seats. <laughs> So we have some, some metrics that make it, uh, that, that uh, privilege some forms of work mm -hmm. and where other work is less recognized, less easily recognized. Yeah. So we need flexible promotion criteria. We need a broader view on what it is to be an academic. Okay, and then, and then uh, coming to this innovative climate, what, what's actually, what are all, all the things that are necessary? Well, I mean, for me, I think one of the key issues for my, for, for my driver for the learning line, why I'm doing that is, be, you know, this idea of having impact and having responsible impact. So, and what it means is that um, I think, you know, innovating just for the sake of innovating is not enough and it's not enough in our times, maybe has not, never been really enough. So I think we really have to question that idea where we, where we work for, what we work for. And that's why I you know, love and you know, further explore and study that idea of responsible innovation, because for me it is, an, it is a way to, to question what we're doing and not just labeling them, for example, sustainable, and then we just go it because it's solar panels. Yeah? So I think this, this um, you know, a climate for me of innovating or of ecosystems is also a climate where we, where we you know, reflect on what we're doing and doing it for not only for theory but also for out there, for, for, for engaging. And yeah. for me, that idea of responsible innovation is, is, is the, the action tool to, to, to get things done. I mean, to, yeah. to sort of to cling to, for, for me, but that's my, you know, my, my, my driver and my theoretical interest there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, is there any question? Yeah. Oh. Will I... Uh, weet je wat ik doe, maar Ik pak een catchbox. Dat is ook wel leuk. Ja. Voor de verandering. Mm. Tjaak. <laughs> Honkbal. Ja, maar ja. doet het alleen niet. Ruud kan de... Does it work? Yeah. Ja. ja. <laughs> uh, my name is Marius Bonen. And I have a question for Johanna. Um, I wonder... I really love your great work in your learning line. I also uh, put in a case in your uh, running program now. Uh, but I wonder, um, in what way do you benefit from your work in the learning line for your research? And in what way can it help to really balance more this, this career perspective that you addressed before? Um, how do you use it? Well, that's a nice question. Thanks very much. Um, yes, what I... Um I'm, a, I'm an ethnographer from my upbringing and of my study. And what ethnographers do is often they study, they study what is happening on the ground or they study something which is in actions and out there. And in a way, what happened is that I, I went the other way around. Rather from theory, theorizing something than doing something, I actually did something. I created a learning line on responsible innovation. And now I'm theorizing what I'm doing. Now, I couldn't talk too much about it. So responsible innovation is actually a notion which is not new. It has been there already in the EU. It has been discussed already. But what I see there, that that notion there is very much um, a governance approach, not very actionable, and it's, it's, it stays in a certain bubble. So what I do through my work and my theorizing is theorizing that notion into another, you know, maybe into another framing and into another theoretical theory even to, um, yeah, to also back the do what, what I'm doing with, with theoretical insights in that. So that's, that's how I'm doing it. But I start inductively, you could say, or, you know, empirically by that. So this is how, how that, that work helps me um, in, uh, in my uh, theorizing, I would say. And are you able to publish it in uh, journals with a good age impact factor, or do you <laughs> do it in a different way? Yes. Uh, um, yes, why? Because I think um, what we all need, and I think what academia needs, is new ideas. So I think, yeah, and I think that's really what, you know, of course, and, and there are many debates where you can, you know, position your, um, you know, your work, so responsible innovation, it's nothing which is just sort of, oh, I just come out there. So they, there are ongoing debates on that, which, on which you can debate, and as theorists or academics, we know that as soon as there are debates, and as soon as you can position yourself, you somehow can sort of fit in into journals. So, yeah, thanks. 
I'll give you my card. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the editor of the European Journal of Engineering Education. See, already. <laughs> Check. Networking. Well, yeah, is this the good networking? This is exactly what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> This is only the beginning, right? So. But this is also, may, also on a European level, it's very important that we keep in touch, we keep discussing this and also the do's, the don'ts, the, the, the pit, pitfalls and stuff yeah, like absolutely. that. Absolutely. I was, we were discussing it yesterday and I think that this is an uncommon way to celebrate your yeah. full professorship <laughs> and bring the people here and us from the outside. This is exactly what it is about, this thinking in terms of creating a space where you can, when the sparkle can, can take place. So, well done. <laughs> You're welcome, I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a question here. Maris, come here naar Maris Gooi? Naar Wies. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've heard a lot of things about changing, innova changing education and innovation and networking, and sometimes I have to take a step back to ask if it's, is it really that bad as it is right now? Because for example, I love my study here at the TUE a lot. I would like extend it forever if I had the possibility. Um, Lifelong learning. But, um, <laughs> but um, I, like a concrete question that pops into my mind is for example that uh, we talk also about responsible innovation and engineering and engineering is typically something where technology should improve something, let's say. Whilst I sometimes think that the, uh, the counter question comes from more social, socially oriented, uh, educated people. People that see uh, not only technology, but see through the eyes of, for example, people in Africa or something else. So if we talk about networking and uh, engineering interdisciplinary, how do you feel uh, collaborating with non-technical universities? Because I think that they have a lot of qualities that we sometimes take for granted. Like we engineers, we know how it works, but I sometimes doubt that. I'm not sure who this question is. No, well, we, we start now uh, the collaboration. Eh? It's just recently, uh, last week, we signed uh, some collaboration with uh, Utrecht University and uh, Wageningen University in the alliance we have from TUA to work on a challenge uh, for Ministry of Defense on food. So together, so we will use the knowledge from Utrecht, which is completely yeah, different. Eh? There's a broad university, not technical university, together with uh, Wageningen, where they are strong in the in the yeah, agro, in the food, and we have the technical perspective and, and combine. So yeah, in February in innovation space we will have challenge together. So yeah, we see this also this need uh, to yeah. collaborate broader. Yeah. But then there's also a gap between seeing the need and actually doing it. Yeah. If you we'll see do. like working interdisciplinary within one university, how difficult that already is to get that done, then it's like uh, well, I can imagine. Yeah. That's yeah. a challenge. It's Another a cha type it's of a challenge. challenge. And a mission, in a way, because you yeah. say we need to shift from <laughs> challenge to mission, yeah. right? That's so correct. This is, uh, but if I may just comment, which was one of the really biggest surprises regarding the engineering education when I was at Michigan, and Michigan is one of these big research universities in the U.S., and um, I was at a time when the College of Engineering just started Entrepreneurship Center, and they were thinking what kind of entrepreneurship courses students would like to take. And the biggest surprise for all of us was that the number one most popular course was the social entrepreneurship. And this was learned by doing, uh, helping um, communities in Detroit, usually very, very, um, very struggling communities, developed social ventures. I have found it fascinating because these people would not go into uh, philanthropy or NGOs after studies, but the fact that during the studies they cared uh, to develop a project that would change real life of real people, real community was absolutely fascinating. And then another aha moment for me when I was um, visiting Santa Clara University in, in San Jose, it's in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, what they have there, they have a center for um, science, technology, and society. Uh, sorry, for business, technology, and society. And they have uh, a whole program collaborating with the tech uh, museum when they develop the prizes, where they go, go, go to global solutions for the global, uh, for the societies of the underprivileged. I'm just thinking that there is such a phenomenal way that you can develop innovation space forward. 
uh, in Michigan, they even have a uh, social venture fund when they invest in this project. So with your industrial power here, there's phenomenal ways you can, you can move this forward. Yeah, perhaps it's all can tell a little bit. Yes. She <laughs> <laughs> there's no plan, of course, it's kind of logic. There's now this plan to have in Eindhoven, which kind of logical design and technology place it it's still we discussing it should be a zone a museum or whatever mm -hmm. and then of course i'm the one that's saying but innovation space is already as a start exactly of this because this mm -hmm. is what's happening because i'm doing the the, the art project so uh -huh. also bringing in the designers and the arts uh, uh, artists in the innovation space so uh, yeah thank you i'm uh, so the only thing you need to do to yeah. follow my theory of network thinking you need to connect with all those great centers yeah, all around so the right. world but and do something the together yeah, the funny <laughs> things we already really connect also you are? Eindhoven, it's really <laughs> and i love this area because uh, everybody is so it's so intertwined fantastic so tue is top mm -hmm. in, in in collaboration with industry but also in the mm -hmm. cultural field i see a lot of well I, at least i'm doing a lot of collaboration everybody wants to work together but then still it's always then how to how to work together and also uh, yeah <laughs> But mm -hmm. this is the next on the step. way yes, in I'm, the process. Uh, I'm working on Fantastic. It. Yes. <laughs> um, any other? <coughs> Bart. Yeah. Hi. Bart. Bart here. Yes. Thanks. Um, yes. First of all, I'd like to uh, to mention that I found this really interesting, and I'm really a fan of the innovative, well, sort of innovative, <laughs> uh, new methods of teaching. Um, but I was wondering, as these new methods are more challenge-based, more open-ended. Um, it becomes more project-based, it becomes more, well, vague a bit. It's more a mo more vague approach. Um, and I think that the big difference with the traditional ways is that they are really structured. So you go to your lecture, you make your uh, exercises. Um, and coupling that to the rising um, mental, uh, the deteriorating state of the mental, how do you say it? State. Well, yeah, stress levels of, of at least the students in the, in the Netherlands, which are also caused by other factors, is there any research or any knowledge about how these new innovative uh, education uh, methods, um, how they handle with this, their student stress levels? Not a, I d I'm not aware of the, with the stress, but perhaps Christina knows something, but I can say this fakeness, that's because you have to deal with uncertainty. Yeah. And if you listen to my lecture later, then you will get to know <laughs> way more. <laughs> Isabel loves open-ended, and this is really for a lot of people like, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, yeah, but I, can rec I recognize it, but it should not give too much stress. So the aim of the coaches, eh, the lecturers as coaches, they should help you to make you feel fine and know that by the end you will succeed, because we know you will succeed. Uh, so taking aware this, this stress level, so that's, if you have good coaches, you, you are helped through the whole trajectory. And there are other ways to have some certainty. So the structure is different. So the structure in the old way of thinking, eh, there is some structure, but we can also bring structure in the process yeah. in another way. So that it gives also, yeah, relaxation, say. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, yeah, there. Can you go Marlous. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Thank you. Uh, I'm from the Department of Computer Science and Mathematics, and I have a question for Christina. Uh, first of all, I happen to be involved in the formal accreditation of our computer science programs this week. Uh, so I suffered from that. <laughs> and um, really an issue for the committee was that we in the bachelor program have a software engineering group project as final project instead of the more traditional individual research project. And that was really a point of discussion for the committee. Where are the academic skills, etc., etc. So that is an illustration of your point that sometimes educating for the professional career might conflict with the academic profession. How do you prepare your bachelor's students for an academic career? Mm. That was also mm. literally a question. Yeah. Mm. So um, I also think that here at the TUE we have a, a, a great opportunity of uh, dealing with this uh, conflict because we have the bachelor college and we have uh, general learning outcomes for all bachelor programs here. But Right now, they are more or less formulated in a traditional way. 
So might it be helpful if we rephrase these general learning outcomes for our bachelor college? Lex, Lex, <laughs> do you listen? <laughs> uh, and, and, and have innovation in some way incorporated in it? And do you have an advice on that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I'd like to say two things. One is that just because we start to teach, for instance, in, in projects and in groups, that doesn't mean anything goes. It doesn't mean yeah. that students can hide behind their friends and yeah. not learn to write for themselves. Yeah. We, we still, I'm, I'm actually a very big fan of individual assessment, even in group mm -hmm. projects, that can be done cost-effectively really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I sometimes feel that I see educational experiments where they have not really considered what they could lose if it's not done well. <laughs> yeah. But in, what, what I'm trying to advocate is uh, an ideal where the students, I mean, today I think our students become a little bit, was it you who said fuck idiot? Yeah. No? You said fuck yes. idiot. I it's said the same fuck, yeah. in Swedish. Oh, okay. Yeah. Fuck idiot means you are sort of very much in your discipline and uh, nothing else. Let's yes. Put it like that. So, so they, have a, they have a disciplinary mindset where they have a specific te technology, maybe a new, very advanced, very sophisticated knowledge, and they want to go out and look for problems where that can be applied. And I want them to be able to do that, but I mm -hmm. also want them to be able to see problems in society, economical, social, uh, sustainable pro problems that are looking for a solution no, no matter what technologies. Mm -hmm. So they, they should be able to be both discipline-led and, and problem-led mm -hmm. at the same time. When they can connect those two, I think we can get great things done. And that is more of our, our view on knowledge on, on a very high level in the programs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we'll have to design the teaching, whether it's actually a, a traditional subject course or if it is a project of some kind. They both have to be designed really well and the assessment has to really work. And students cannot be too much stressed. We can't just uh, heap it onto them. <laughs> So, so we still need a lot of skill to implement this successfully.